Thanks for listening to The Derivative. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of RCM Alternatives, their affiliates, or companies featured. Due to industry regulations, participants on this podcast are instructed not to make specific trade recommendations nor reference past or potential profits, and listeners are reminded that managed futures, commodity trading, and other alternative investments are complex and carry a risk of substantial losses. As such, they are not suitable for all investors. Welcome to The Derivative by RCM Alternatives, where we dive into what makes alternative investments go, analyze the strategies of unique hedge fund managers, and chat with interesting guests from across the investment world. What matters for the way that we as a society experience inflation so that it becomes something that plays a role in our social games of investing in politics is for it to be reflected in wages and prices. It is. <laughs> this is happening, right? If you don't see what is happening in terms of employers and employee expectations about wages, not just new employees, but also existing across the spectrum. If you don't see that the barge has turned, and these things are barges, right? These these, these like barges sail in one direction for 20 years. Yeah. And then they slow down and then they, there, they start going the other direction. The barge is going the other direction on wage expectations. The barge is going the other way on price expectations. And I'm never, I just can't forget that, right? That, that in the real economy, the autos in his housing is now the opposite of 07. It's the opposite of Q4 of 07, where expectations are not the price is going to go down and your car is going to go down. Right? No, the expectation is the other way. And these barges do not move easily. But when they move, they keep moving. Hello and happy summer. We're here recording on August 4th, having just had Lollapalooza in Chicago and pretty much feeling things are back to normal. Uh, But we also have more and more Delta variant headlines and school starting back up in a few weeks and likely mask mandate for the kids. Uh, and then I've gotten some sticker shot lately with uh, a trip to Montana coming up and paying $2,500 or so for a rental car. So the inflation narrative is kicking strong. Uh, and I thought, who do I know that can talk about the Delta variant and the Delta and in inflation expectations? And it had to be Ben Hunt of the wonderful blog, narrative negotiator website, Epsilon Theory, and co-founder at Second Foundation Partners. So welcome back, Ben. Great to be back, Jeff. That's uh... Wow, twenty five hundred for a rental car, huh? <laughs> yeah, I actually ended up doing Turo, which is like an Airbnb for cars. It's kind of you rent other people's cars. Really? Yeah, yeah. So that was about half the cost, but still expensive. So I, I don't know what's going on in rental car world. I think Fort I'm Myers. Just tra- I'm sure it's just transitory, Jeff. Come on, man. Yeah. <laughs> it, well, I'm sure if you're the rental car CEO, you're going to be like, "Oh, build more car." You're going to be like, "Cool, we can <laughs> we can charge more. I can throw in some extra fees." Um, it's all good. So we did a pod about a year ago, I think, and went yep. through your background and all that. So I'm going to skip the uh, good stuff there about the farm. Uh, and we'll put a link in the show notes for those who want to hear how Ben raises bees and used to be a trend follower. Uh, and you were telling me offline, you're just fixing a fence out there on the farm. I was the never ending work of uh, fence, fence fixing. It's um, yeah. Yeah. Where's a uh, Where's Tom Sawyer or Huck Finn or whoever it is when you need it? Exactly. Then I've seen some of your posts that you lost a beloved goat and some other animals. That's just normal farm life as well. It's the circle of life, man. It really is. It's, uh, you you know, I'm such a dilettante farmer, right? I mean, we've got our animals are essentially pets. I mean, not essentially. We don't raise anything for meat. That 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 would seem to be terribly rude. (laughs) <laughs> right, so but we've we've got sheep for wool, and although the wool is crappy, I mean they're uh, but they're they're basically movable works of art. Uh, that's the way I like to think of them, and it's uh, it's, it's that need uh, to be fed though as well. Yeah. Well, they do, and, and so my, my daughter, four daughters, they've each taken turns. They do all the farm work except for the bees and the tractor. That's my 
purview. And I guess that's, you know, fixing. I guess that, that's me also. But I got to tell you, Jeff, it, it, and it is connected with that whole circle of life thing. The responsibility for kids to have to take care of living animals and take care of them. Frankly, I mean, that's not taking away from away from house pets, which we've got a ton also, <laughs> dogs and cats and like that. But there's keeping an animal outside. It depends on you to live. And there's no one else they can depend on. It's it's a tremendous responsibility, right? And it's 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 just been uh, that's really why we did it, right? It was really because this is the environment we wanted to raise our family in. And it's been the best thing, Jeff. It really, has been the best thing. Uh, which goes all the way down to the fence mending, right? So you got to feed them, you got to keep <laughs> the keep the wolves out, all that stuff. Although, can a fence stop a wolf or? A coyote? Well, well, no, no, they don't, not always. Uh, coyotes are our issue around here, but the, our dogs do an okay job of, of of keeping out the coyotes. It's it, it's amazing stories of this stuff, though, the the Jeff which you learned. So most sheep herders, so we've got sheep and we've got goats. And horses and chickens and bees and all like that. But the um, a lot of the, the sheep herders and goat herders, say up in New Hampshire or something, who do it for goat milk to make cheese, they'll they'll have a, uh, a llama or uh, or an alpaca, right? Some some sort of big goat like animal, right? Because they're amazingly protective. Some animals yeah. are just really protective. I, I, I find you know we've got a goat that's pretty protective and. Anyway, you uh, the, the 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 pack or the flock uh, makes his way. That's for sure. So the llama will protect the goats, even though he's not yes. related. Oh. Correct. Um, Correct. All I know about llamas is that's how Chicago's Scotty Pippen supposedly lost a lot of his earnings. He owned a llama farm and gotten <laughs> got built out of some money. <laughs> yeah, I think you know llama farms and uh, ostrich farms. I think. Uh, I think they've been the the, the downfall of, of, of many a young man. It yeah, is, that was big yeah. stuff in the 90s. Let's get to the good stuff. So let's start with a little inconvenient truth that this pandemic is still ongoing, uh, yeah. despite all our best efforts to pretend it's not. Uh, <laughs> you were super early on the initial pandemic. Uh, I think partly because your brain works uh, in a geometric manner instead mm-hmm. of a linear manner. So you knew that 17 cases in Connecticut was a big deal. You yeah. know, not that it was going to be 18 tomorrow. It was going to be 34 tomorrow. Um, yeah. And partly because of your narrative machine. So what are, your, what are you seeing with this Delta variant? What are you seeing with everything you're doing in that space? You know, Jeff... I think uh, I'll, say, I'll, I'll say a couple of things. One is that the disconnect between real world and market world is even more cavernous or canyon-like today than it was uh, certainly a year ago today, but, but, even, but, but even more so from last uh, March, let's say, when we were, I at least was, was, was really alarmed and you know, focused on that there would be real world consequences or market world consequences for the real world impact of the initial COVID spread. I, I think that's my first takeaway there, Jeff, is, is that this Delta variant is, is, is it's just, it's just brutal, right? I mean, you've got a R naught, I don't know, maybe it's eight, maybe it's nine. I mean, that, that's just, those are insane numbers. That, that's, you know, you can catch this, you know, Two seconds. It doesn't take five minutes of exposure, right? Or ten minutes. Of it's two seconds. It's, it's just it's just insane. Uh, but you know, you can see it. I mean, you know, maybe you see a little bit of you know concerns, quote unquote, in in in, in rates or in, in bond world. Mm-hmm. But man, our our markets, particularly our risk assets, they're just so insulated from anything that happens in the real world. That's my, you know, my first big observation. The, the second observation I'd make is that it, we're, we're at the point societally where it is now impossible for me to write about COVID. It's impossible for me to talk about it. And I say that because 
you know, I'm not, I'm not a lockdown guy, right? Uh, and I also, I wear an N90, a KN95 mask when I go out. You know, I think that vaccines are the, you know, one of the greatest scientific developments this country's seen in 50 years, the freaking miracle. I, I, I can't say what I want to say about, about COVID because when I do, it is immediately either dismissed by those who think I'm a fear monger or whatever, or if I'm talking about how I think cloth masks are essentially theater and that the, the noble lies that have been told us by everyone, but particularly by Fauci and the CDC and the like, I, how destructive I think that's been to our public health efforts. I get auto-tuned by the other side. I get dismissed by the other side. It, it, it's impossible to say anything. There, there is no middle ground anymore, Jeff, in any sort of communications around COVID. It's just been totally... Yeah. Which is crazy, right? Like you'd, you'd think you'd get more tribalized on like the Fed is doing this or that and get right, a bunch of right. people getting upset at that. But no, they want to come after you for uh, your thoughts on COVID. And they're not thought, you're not just saying crazy stuff, in my opinion, right? You're you're trying to quote facts. You're trying to put numbers out there. You're calling out people who do a poor job of putting numbers out there. Um so yeah, it's it's weird pushback to me for sure from afar. Yeah, look, I, I mean, by training and experience, Jeff. I mean, this is this is what I do. I, I, this is what my PhD was in was in statistical analysis of this stuff. As you say, thinking geometrically or at least exponentially and not just linearly, and understanding what that means, and understanding again how governments lie with their statistics, almost always to to um, portray a kinder, gentler, you know, yeah. experience, whether it was the lies of China, the lies of the World Health Organization, uh, our own, you know, administration's efforts to, 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 to minimize the, the, the impact of all this. And then, you know, look, I group we put together, we, we, we bought and distributed over 500,000 N95 masks directly to doctors and nurses and firemen and EMTs all over the country. I mean, we just, we did this for the better part of a year. Yeah. Unbelievable. 500,000. Yep. 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 All in batches of 100 and 200. We sent out to, you know, thousands of individual, you know, uh, nurse, nursing staffs, uh, EMT departments, those uh, clinics everywhere, all, every, every state in the country. Yeah. And I've even seen pushback for you on that, which is like, Hey, it's great. It's, it's unbelievable. Like, why, why do you attack him for that? He's trying to help people. Yeah. But their, their thing is like, oh, he's just trying to help people to look good. It wasn't really needed. Oh, no. What's their angle there? No idea. I, I really don't have an idea. This is, I guess, what I mean, that it's become so... I thought the craziness would kind of die down after 600,000 Americans and 4 million humans die from this. Yeah. Uh, but it hasn't. It hasn't at all. I got to tell you, Jeff, I mean, this, this gets into our conversation about inflation also. The, 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 the big picture around inflation, what really distresses me is that it also has been auto-tuned now. It's also been tribalized, where you've got, you know, AOC talking to Don Lemon about how it's just supply chain stress and don't, don't worry. I, I mean, when did this become a DNC talking point? Yeah. Answer, answer when it became an RNC talking point to talk about Biden inflation, you know, and it just, it, it's just very distressing to me that, that, you know, I call it, or we like to call it what we write, auto-tuning, that, that whatever music is being played, it gets auto-tuned to fit with the marching band of either the MAGA or RNC crowd or the AOC DNC crowd. And it's just so depressing because now I'm having a harder and harder time. <laughs> you know, I said I can't really talk about COVID anymore. I'm having a harder time talking about inflation anymore. Because when I talk about what I look at, which is the embeddedness of inflation expectations in autos, you know, the rental car, you know, autos, housing, and stonks, right? 
you, you know, I half the audience tunes me out. It's like, oh, you're just, you know, you're, you're just a Biden hater. And it's like, are, are you? <laughs> I did, ah, anyway, yeah. I just, but, uh, but you're I'm rather, frustrated. yeah, and it seems to me you're apolitical and you're just trying to point out uh, numbers and facts, right? And say, here's, here's the narrative they're trying to sell you on both sides. Right. No, no one side is right or wrong. Well, that, that, that's right. I, I wouldn't call myself apolitical. Right? I, 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 yeah, mean, yeah. I, I mean, I mean, there's you don't have a political motive, I'm saying. Yeah. That's correct. That is really correct. I think that the, the, the what's going to save our country is bottom up action, not top down action through a political party or a big corporation, because it's only from the bottom up that you can find a group of people who treat each other as autonomous human beings, not as a means to some end. That, that, that to me is what it's all about. It's, it's, it's finding your pack, as I like to call it, the people who will treat you for who you are, a person in your own right. And with those people, you can have a conversation, right? I can, I can talk to somebody who's in my pack about you know, vaccinations. And you know, we did this the other day. We've got a, you know, so we've got a couple of thousand subscribers in Epsilon Theory every Friday. And about 50 or so we get together on a Zoom call. And um, we had a great conversation about vaccination and about my view that it is your duty to others to be vaccinated. It's not just for your own protection, but there is an active duty as a citizen uh, in the same way you don't drive drunk, I think everyone should be vaccinated. But I'm able to have a very good conversation with someone who feels very differently about that because I know that they're not treating me instrumentally. They're not looking to score points because they're gonna go tweet about it yeah. for their own gain, right? It's, a, it's an honest conversation between people who I, I trust have full hearts on this matter. And that's that's what's so lacking to Jay Jeff. It's 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 um, we get auto tuned and we get used as instruments. Auto tuned. I like that. Um, and yeah, I used to tell people with the flu vaccine way before COVID, like, no, it's not about you. And people are like, oh, I never get the flu. I'm like, yes, but you can carry it and give it to my grandma or some little kid. Like the flu and some doctor told me, I actually had no idea about that until a doctor, right. Yep. Told me of like, yes, exactly. you're getting it. You're 30. This was years ago. You're 30 year old, healthy male, but you can get this because it's helping other people. I'm like, okay, that's fine. Doesn't, it doesn't bother me. Stick it in my arm. But I can see yep. the other side where people are like, no, I don't want you sticking something in my arm that, that isn't needed. And, and I can see that too, Jeff. I absolutely can see that too. And I think you have to respect that. And, and that's why it's so hard to have an honest conversation yeah. with anyone. Do you uh, think some of the vaccine stuff is because it's uh, mRNA, like because it's actually editing or supposedly, you know, I'm trying to get a, actually a private equity guy that invested into that on the pod next week, but right. It's editing the, DNA sequence. It's giving the instructions to help create this uh, immunity. Like, do you think that's part of the reason of like, yeah, that seems like GMO or right. That seems like stuff I don't want in my body versus if it were a normal quote unquote, normal vaccine, people would have more, uh, they'd be more willing to get it. I think everyone's got their diff a different two things. One risk spectrum, risk tolerance. And also we all have our own I'll say sensitivities to narratives and ideas. Yeah. No, and, and I, so, so, so the short answer to your question is yes, of course. I mean, for some people, they hear that and that that's a that's a meme or that's an idea that clicks with something in their brain. So, oh my God, I don't want that. And I, well, I think what's counterproductive is to tell somebody, you know, oh, you're wrong. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Because and this is what I mean about treating people as you know autonomous human beings. I, I, I think it's so important to respect those decisions. And I want to add to that calculus that I think everyone makes. 
what you just said, right? Which is that, yes, there's the calculus of, okay, what risks you personally are willing to take in terms of the, 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 the virus and the, the, the vaccine treatments and the like. There is also consideration of risks to others because if you do catch this, you will almost certainly pass it along to others. And uh, it, you know, we, <laughs> it's funny. We live in the society, Jeff, where we accept so little risk in almost everything we do. And, and, I, and I say that because, you know, as part of this exercise of trying to kind of get a sense of, well, how much risk you pose to others if you catch the Delta variant? So we're comparing it to, okay, what, what, is the, what are the, the odds, right, of you killing someone else if you mm -hmm. drive drunk? And so we went on the, 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 the DUI stats and the, they're, they've been collected. And it's, <laughs> it's not just a little more dangerous to others to catch COVID than to drive drunk. It's about 5,000 more times dangerous. And, and I, I say these numbers, right? And, and, and I was looking at it and said, well, there, there are two ways to interpret this. One is that, you know, there's a real substantial risk to catch COVID if you're going to pass it on to someone else who may not be in the same situation that you are in in terms of their health and ability to, to, to survive. I mean, I mean, you experienced it. Hell, you, yeah. know, you know this, Jeff. Uh, that's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is, look, I think, like everyone else, I'm, I think driving while intoxicated, driving influence is, is abhorrent and it's just awful, it's terrible. It, <laughs> The odds of you actually killing somebody or hurting somebody else driving drunk are actually extremely, ex extraordinarily low. And I was going to say, be, be careful what you say here. People are going to, their takeaway is going to be, like, oh, it's okay to drive drunk. That's right. That's right. That's what I don't need about getting auto tuned, right? This is yeah. the kind of society we live in. And, and, and it's, it's just very challenging today because we, we I understand why we have such stringent rules against driving drunk. I'm thrilled we have those rules. I abide by those rules. I believe in those rules. And yet, I can show you the numbers, right? Yeah. You're far more likely to kill someone else by catching COVID, by being unvaccinated, than by drive drunk, not just a little more likely, thousands of times more likely. And, and that's why I find it so hard to have these conversations. Right. And then that was early on, right? Of like, are we going to make people go back to the office? Can we give all the companies legal protection in case someone gets COVID and dies while in the office? Right. That was a, uh, a, a narrative there for a minute of like, how are we going to legally protect those who, I, who infect others? Right. Yep. And I don't know if that was ever solved. I don't think so. Yeah. No, nope. <laughs> nope. nope, never saw. But hey, hey, did you get your did you get your Robin Hood call spread on today, Jeff? I mean, come on. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Do you think a lot of that is because, like, if the Delta variant is bad, there'll be more stimulus that can go into stocks and stocks go up, right? That's kind of the calculus there, of like. Right. If, if the Delta variant's not bad, the economy's back, everything's good, buy stocks. If the Delta variant's bad, we're going to stimulate the economy and everything's good and buy stocks. Correct. So, so they, we're, we're more entrenched than ever in a world where there is no deflationary shock that can derail risk assets. Sorry, it doesn't exist. I, 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 I don't even think a, a war with China at this point over Taiwan, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, the, you, we, we, we get hit for, for a couple of weeks and then, you know, there'd be another couple of trillion dollars, you know, pumped down. And I, I, re I really don't see any deflationary shock that can derail risk assets. Now, that, you know, leaves the question, can an inflationary shock derail risk assets? Yes, absolutely. Right now though, and this is what we're picking up in our narrative analysis, the 
Fed's mantra of this is transitory. If it's not transitory, we have it under control. If we don't have it under control, this is what we wanted anyway, <laughs> right? Yeah. You know, this this is kind of the litany of you know our you know the 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 our fathers and the Hail Marys that that one must say 50 times before going into the Eccles building. But this, this, this mantra, these prayers are now common knowledge. This is the dominant narrative on Wall Street, but within financial media that, uh, you know, it's, you know, don't, don't worry your little head about it. And I think that until that changes, until um, you see it, the narrative shifting to, oh my goodness, I think the Fed's a little bit, you know, behind the curve here and blah, blah, blah. And they're going to have to tighten sooner, or blah, et cetera. They're going to have to taper sooner. Until that gets started, right? I, I, don't, I don't see what derails risk assets. And, you know, that's, that it goes against kind of what I feel in my gut because I, I look at real world and I, and I see what's happening around Delta. You know, my family he lives in Alabama. You know, and it's like, oh my God, here we go again. Yeah, bad down there. Uh, but um, but on that Fed, and I was arguing with the economist the other day. Like, does it does it matter? I'm not solely on the MMT side, but right, they'll just keep doing stimulus. They'll keep printing, and they'll keep right. saving everything. They'll buy. They'll go out right and buy equities like Japan and Europe, right? Like whatever they'll have they have to will. do to keep the game going, they're going to do. So to borrow, right. one of there your is phrases, no deflationary shock. There is no deflationary impetus that can derail risk assets. It has to be a uh, inflationary. Now, what I will say though is, I'm increasingly getting whiffs of. Then we can call it stagflation but disappointing growth alongside well-embedded inflation expectations and the things that matter in the real economy, autos, houses, and financial assets. Right? So inflation expectations well-embedded in those big three. Uh, I'll say certainly a demand slowdown in, you know, in, in the real economy all at the same time. Now you look at the GDP on Q2, Six point whatever percent, you know, huzzah! That sounds great. Well, you know yeah. what? It wasn't eight and a half percent, right? It wasn't different. It's like, hmm. yeah. You look at the, the housing market. I've seen a lot of housing markets today, where the prices keep going up, right? but the transaction level is just is just way off. A lot of these markets are just frozen, right? Because you don't have, you know, you don't have a lot of supply, but you also don't have a lot of demand. And, and I'm seeing that in more and more markets around there. And so that, that leads to bad or disappointing growth numbers at the same time that your expectation for increasing wages and increasing prices makes it more difficult for the Fed to do, I'll say, traditional you know, aggregate demand stimulus, right? I mean, you know, cut rates now, right? Oh, really? You're going you're gonna to cut rate? You're going you're, you're gonna, to... We're going to go to ZERP. Right? Yeah. Because, uh, you know, demand's a little soft in places when we're growing at 6% GDP. It, it, this is the kind of stuff that I think that, that, that does create a potential problem for risk assets, equity markets in particular. But, um, you know, you've still got to see that show up in the narrative. People have got to, the, the missionaries have got to start talking about that. They're not. And until they do, it's going to be party on. But that's what we're watching for. Who are, a few things there. One, you mentioned, who are the missionaries, first of all? Like you're saying yeah. Fed chairs and whatnot, or like uh, the there, Bill, so, Bill so Gross's any, L. Lorene's of the world, or, or who? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the short answer is that any famous person, anyone with access to a printing press or a TV camera can be a missionary. And... A missionary is someone who presents an opinion as fact. The most powerful missionary in the world by an order of magnitude is Jay Powell. Uh, you know, other 
central bank chairs are kind of 2A and 2B. Biden is so-so, you know, you know it's, it's interesting, presidents aren't, aren't as big of a missionary as you expect. Yeah. They're, they're not as big as like say Warren Buffett. You know, so when Warren Buffett goes on CNBC and talks his book, I mean, that's what I mean by a missionary. Any, anyone on CNBC is a missionary. Yeah. <laughs> so Alan so Ariad, absolutely. Of course, of course, Mom does, right? Uh, yeah, I dated myself with Bill Gross. I'm not sure the last time he's been <laughs> on TV. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Bill Gross has got his own issues now, right? With his, yeah, the, some, oh, that camera. Noise, some noise war with his neighbors. And oh my God, he is. <laughs> He's, a, he's an ET subscriber, though, you know, so, so I, I got a nice email once from Bill Gross. <laughs> you know, you hear, look, you know, you can look up, you can read the stories about Bill Gross. My favorite, sorry, I'll get to the ET story, but yeah, no, no. that's not theory story. But, you know, my favorite story about Bill Gross was at PIMCO was the, the, <laughs> the fit he would throw if in stapling a report, you did not put the staple at a diagonal angle oh, no. to make the page turning a little bit easier. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I, you, you know, you can't make this stuff up. Yeah. This, is, this is a true thing from someone who was there. The fits you would throw about, well, the, the staples back there. Anyway, no he, metal I got a hanging. nice email to him. That's right, right? I got yeah. a nice email to him from one day because I quoted Emily Dickinson and apparently he's, as I am, an enormous Emily Dickinson fan. Who knew? Who, Who knew? knew? Um, and then the second part of that, you mentioned wage growth. So yeah. can, can any of those inflationary pressures happen without wage growth? Like, it seems the answer would be, of course, yes. But also it seems eh, maybe not. Right? Because I don't know. Well, look, 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 it, inflation, inflation that matters is always expressed in wages and prices, period, full stop, right? I, you, you know, if I have to have anyone say, you know, inflation's a monetary phenomenon, okay, just, just fine. That's a tautology, frankly, right? It's a, it, that can't be disproven. What, gosh, I, I, just, I just believe this so strongly. What, what matters for the way that we as a society experience inflation so that it becomes something that plays a role in our social games of investing in politics is for it to be reflected in wages and prices. It is. <laughs> this is happening, right? If, if yeah. you don't see what is happening in terms of employers and employee expectations about wages, not just new employees, but also existing every, across the spectrum. If you don't see that the barge has turned, and these things are barges, right? These, these, these like barges sail in one direction for 20 years. Yeah. And then they slow down and then they, there, they start going the other direction. The barge is going the other direction on wage expectations. The barge is going the other way on price expectations. I, you know, in the hedge fund I ran, right, we did well in 05, 06, and 07. You know, who cares? Everybody did well in 05, 06, 07. <laughs> we had a great year in 08. Right? And that's what's made our bones, and that's what made the fund. And, you know, my partner and I, he was looking at it from the, the perspective of the fundament of the real economy. I was looking at it from the perspective of CDS and all like this. We both came to the same conclusion. And I'll say from this perspective, looking at the real economy, I'll never forget this. You saw in Q4 of 07, you saw autos and you saw houses roll over, prices roll over. We didn't yet have the edifice that had been constructed to protect against deflationary shocks. So when you saw the prices of autos and housing roll over in Q4 of 07, and you combine that with the, what we were seeing in terms of the systemic risk in the, in the financial sector around credit default swaps and you know, this inverted pyramid of, of you know, residential mortgage-backed securities, we, we put on our short going into 08 and the rest was history. 
yeah. for, for, our, for our fund. I'm never, I just can't forget that, right? That, that in the real economy, the autos and his housing is now the opposite of 07. It's the opposite of Q4 of 07, where expectations are not that the price is going to go down and your car is going to go down. Right? No, the expectation is the other way. And these barges do not move easily, but when they move, they keep moving. And you combine that, you know, I, I laughed about, you know, Robin Hood. I mean, did, you, did you see freaking Robin Hood today? Yeah. I mean, it's up 50 percent, man, after 20 percent yesterday. And because like, options are trading on it now. That's what happened. Right. I mean, oh, well, oh, great. You know, it's two days past eight here. Well, options get to trade on it. So, of course, it's going to be up. Of, of course, that's worth whatever, 30 billion dollars in market, market cap. cap. Are you? And they like 300,000 or so of their customers, they put into the IPO. Yeah. 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 Which yeah. is the that's ultimate it. self-fulfilling, uh, right? That's that's going to be a new model out there. Like start a brokerage, have your customers be part of the IPO, then they get extra money margin yeah. and then they can trade more and it'll just keep feeding on itself. So. Right. Because they're, 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 they're the memesters anyway. I, it's like, look, this is what I mean by inflation expectations now embedded into I'm not going to say risk assets again. I'm going to say stocks, right? Yeah. That's where inflation expectations are embedded. And, and so you, you've, you've got inflation expectations. You're, we all think that the price of our car is going up, our house is going up, and our stocks are going up. And if that's what we all think, <laughs> then, then and, and we get, our expectations that well, we deserve to be paid more. Yeah, or we need to be paid more because you have to be paid more. Oh my God, we deserve to be paid more. That combination, in addition to what's making me kind of nervous about kind of disappointing growth, because like I say, take a look at the transactions. The prices are going up, but it's not like we've got a lot of volume, you know, following that. And what, At least I, I'm talking about, you know, houses and cars, right? I'm, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm not talking about stocks. Houses to me, like I've got friends who write their houses, they could sell it, make a huge profit, but then they got to go buy something else. So it's like, there's that problem too. I'm like, now, then what? Then what do I do? Unless you're going to sell it and move to some totally different area at a cheaper price, it's not necessarily a financial windfall, right? Well, well think about what you just said. They say we could sell it for a great price. I do you think that... So, Real life example. We added this yeah. this uh, rental house um, after twenty years, and we finally said, "Okay, now's a good time to put it on market for exactly what we all think." Oh my God, we're going to get a great price for this. Put it on the market. By the way, you know, up here in you know Fairfield County, Connecticut, I'm basically putting out for just a honest to God, I'm putting out on the market for twenty percent more than I paid for it twenty years ago. Wow. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's how crappy the real estate market's been in, in Connecticut for 20 years, 20 years. Uh, but I'm, I'm excited, man. If I could get that, that's, yeah. that's better than it was a couple of years ago. So I'm really excited to get that. There are no buyers. There are no buyers, Jeff. I, I mean, there, there, there's not a big supply of houses, but there are no buyers. So this is what I mean. We've all got these expectations that the price is going to be great. Uh but there is, and, and the lack of supply keeps those expectations high. What I'm telling you is there's a lack of buyers too. Hmm. And so there are just not many transactions happening, even though we all believe that the prices are going higher still. And does it matter to you or does it matter at all if, if what comes first, prices higher than wages higher or wages higher than prices higher? Well, and this is why I'm not apolitical. I, I hope wages go higher, right? Yeah. I, 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 I think that for everything I believe politically, wages need to, that, that the, the polarization and the disparities we have in wealth generation, in large part, thanks to our friends at the Fed, right? And their inflation of financial assets, I think that's ultimately a political disaster. So I'm 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 very happy that wages go up. And I'm a small business owner. I pay wages yeah. to people. And I'm so I it makes me happy that wages are going up. 
What I know, however, is that wages do not go up in a vacuum and that companies are now, you know, you see this every, every, every day, they're able to raise prices. Why are they able to raise prices? Because we all think the prices are going higher. And this, the, it is a classic wage price inflation spiral. It's, it, you know, you, you, we started this conversation talking about COVID, yeah. right? And looking at it last February and March and looking at the Chinese numbers and saying, okay, they're lying. That's not what an exponential function looks like. They're clearly lying. This is very dangerous. We need to start looking at masks, et cetera, like that. Look, to, to me, it's the same thing with wage and price inflation. Look, yeah. the spiral is happening. Don't tell me it's not happening. I, I, you, you see it every day. You see it in our own lives. How many conversations have you had with neighbors about home prices? Yeah, lots. Lots. Yeah, lots. And, and myself, small business, have lost an employee to a big tech company who can yes. pay 50% more plus stock. Exactly. Out, plus all this. So it's like, yeah, we feel it in real time for sure. You feel you you feel it all the time, right? And 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 yet it's this. And then and then does it good. matter if it's transitory? Does right? Sure. If it's transitory exactly. for three months, but I lost that employee, like who cares? That, that was transitory. Yeah, yeah. I'm so I'm so sick of the whole transitory, you know, debate because it, it it's, it's who came it's, up with it's, that? It's meaningless. Did, did they sit in the Fed boardroom and come up with that uh, word? It uh, got a long. Yeah, history. yeah. I, I I mean I look. This has been the big change of the last 12, 13 years in, in everything we do, every, whether every aspect of government, every aspect of corporate life, you name it, is that communication policy, shaping and crafting your narrative, everybody knows this is how the game is played. A lot of conscious attention is paid to it. And it, it you know, whether you're a sports team, whether you're a, a central bank, whether you're a... Yeah. Mom and Pop Corporation, everyone knows you need to shape your own narrative and that's how you, how you survive in this world. So absolutely, it's, it's, it's conscious. Well, bring me to your uh, burn it the fuck down, ma'am. <laughs> B-I-T-F-D. Uh, so yeah. we didn't get to cover that last time. So a lot of that in the early days seemed to focus on stock buybacks. Uh, you know, the DECA millionaires or what do you call those guys? Yeah, DECA millionaires. So, but, but, but let me be really clear. What, what, stock buybacks are fine. When I was running my hedge fund, I love to see a company buy back stock. Right? Yeah. I loved it. I loved it, right? Okay, so we're going, we're going to, to create your earnings, blah, blah, blah. I, I, I get it. I get it. I'd much rather you buy back your stock than do some cockamamie acquisition. Yeah. Right? And, and, you know, you're not going to do a dividend. I know that. So great, buy back stock. What makes me angry though, is that when stock buybacks are used to sterilize massive stock grants to management, right? Yeah, and so all the pushback you get is, hey, stock backs are, they don't matter. They're just the same capital structure. Exactly, I was returning cash to shareholders. Yeah. I get it, man. But <laughs> when they're used to sterilize, when, you're, when the company is buying back stock with one hand, and they're giving it away with the other hand, right? That stock buyback, that money does not return to shareholders. It's right. just math, as the kids say, it right? It is management. a pure wealth transfer from shareholders to management. Pure wealth transfer to the tune of hundreds of billions of dollars. And, and that's, you know, that's why I was saying deck of millionaires, right? So the, meaning that the, the chief accounting officer at any S and P five hundred company, is a deca millionaire. Right? right? They're not risk takers. They're not entrepreneurs. They're not founders. Look, a founder, a risk taker, an entrepreneur wants to make hundred million dollars. Great, more power to you, buddy. Right? But we're in a world now where being a line manager of an S&P 500 company has never been, there's never been a more lucrative job choice in the world. 
the risk reward's never been better. But Zero risk, enormous reward. That's does that make you mad from a like shareholder perspective or from a like I should have been a, one of those guys perspective? <laughs> Uh, or, not the latter. I mean, I'm just, I'm just not built that way. I'd be a terrible chief accounting officer. I'd <laughs> die. I'd be the worst. I'd be the worst. Uh, I wouldn't last. But no, what, what burns me up, Jeff, is the mendacity. I, it, what burns me up is the conscious subversion of the or hiding of this practice under yay stock buybacks, yay capitalism, yay returning money to shareholders. When, yeah, <laughs> it's just math. It ain't returning money to shareholders if you're sterilizing the stock that you're handing out. Well, it's both, right? So they are returning to stare, but inside the returning to shareholders, there's this slice that's going direct to management through the options. Yeah, it is an enormous slice. So yeah. I, I like to call it the rake, right? So, rake. so you know, you know, you, 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 you know, you go to Vegas and you, you, you know, you play at the poker table there, the house takes the, the rake. And, and usually it's, you know, it's a couple of bucks out of a, out of a big pot. It's nothing, right? Maybe 1%, maybe, right? Is the rake 2%? The rake at, I'll use an example, JP Morgan, right? The rake is 18 to 20%. That's the rake. Meaning right. the stock buybacks, 18 to 20% goes to sterilize uh, stock rates. That money does not go to shareholders. But did all the big firms that own these stocks know the rake? They know the percent? Like it's like showing up at the poker table in Vegas and you know the rake and you say, cool, I still want to play, right? So in that scenario does it matter right like if if the they're getting rich the shareholders are getting rich everyone's getting rich why does it matter well are are, are the shareholders getting rich you know so, so yeah leave that aside right it again that's why i'm not apolitical right yeah <laughs> i i uh jamie diamond bless his heart jamie diamond is not a founder jamie diamond is not an entrepreneur Jamie Dimon is not a risk taker. Jamie Dimon is a, by all accounts, very good bank manager. And he, is bank. A, and he is a billionaire for being a manager. It is the triumph of the manager. Right? And, and I think that the dynamism in our economy, the productivity of our economy, the fire that creates real growth in our economy comes from risk-taking, entrepreneurship, everything that Jamie Dimon is not. And those qualities, entrepreneurship, risk-taking, et cetera, those are not rewarded in our system to an iota, to a fraction. Yeah of what management in a too big to fail company is awarded. JP Morgan cannot fail, right? It, by law, by law, JP Morgan cannot fail. No matter what he does, right? No matter what he does. And I'm sure whatever it is he does, I, I, you know, enough people have told me how great Jamie Diamond is. I go, God forbid, I can't deny that. When you could argue that him getting them to the point where they're by law too big to fail is worth paying them at least a billion dollars. <laughs> well, we know what happened for them to become too big to fail. Yeah, they fail. Right? <laughs> the, 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 they, he, he and others broke our economy is how they became too big to fail. Right. So, um, you know, there but by the grace of God. So anyway. And then more men on, on that soapbox anyway. Yeah, yeah. But beyond even the beyond the you, you, you know when I started saying you know burn it the fuck down Jeff I started saying that when uh, Epstein yes uh, was found dead yeah because I, I that that and and look and I, I have no idea whether it was suicide I, I don't, what I'm saying is I don't care right a a non-corrupt state has one job 
when Jeffrey Epstein is in jail, is you keep Make him sure alive for trial. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. You have one. Jo- you have one job. Yeah. <laughs> one job. And for that not to happen, for that that kind of threw me. I'm not gonna lie. That 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 threw me for a loop. I, I have not felt so shook. Uh, you know, the last time I felt that shook was in. Um, September and October of, of 08. Yeah. When I had, you know, oh man, I was short everything. And I got, I mean, our fund, we were killing it, killing it. And I remember, you know, I was looking at the, the you know, the screen one day and said, yeah, oh my God, you know, we made like 5% that day because the, the world yeah. was just collapsing around us. And then I got a call from my buddy at, you know, it was still Lehman then time, but although not much longer. And it all of a sudden it struck me. It's like, wait a second. If this all yeah, collapses, can I make? Can I cash who, that out? Yeah. Who's going to pay me? Right? How am I going to catch this out? Right? And and then you know we got the uh, temporary liquidity guarantee program by the the U.S. Treasury, where they went and they backstopped the senior debt, senior unsecured debt of all bank holding companies like J.P. Morgan. Like and know, even Morgan like, Stanley and Goldman Sachs, who became bank holding companies. That's what I was going to say, even let companies. them become one. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Right. So, you know, the most amazing coincidence, we're going to become a federal bank company. And then the next week, here's the temporary liquidity guarantee program where, oh, the senior unsecured debt of J.P. Morgan is now backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And for that, J, you know, J.B. Diamond becomes a billionaire. Give me a fucking break, right? So those two events, right? The, the the temporary liquidity guarantee program where the full faith and credit of the United States government was put behind Goldman Sachs debt, right? And Epstein dying jail. It's like there are these kind of moments in your life, right? Where the 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 the, the pleasant skin is kind of ripped off to show the naked sinews of power yeah. below it. And anyway, that that tends to spur a little, you know, burn it the fuck down anger. Right. To me, I'm trying, like, Jeff. I'm trying, trying to get calm. No, I love it. Uh, to me, it's like the uh, right. It's like the Matrix. It's like, do you really want to see what's on the other side exactly. of the curtain? Um, or this new movie with uh, Ryan Reynolds, guy, where he's inside yeah. a video game but he doesn't know it. So it exactly. seems to be the main theme you're trying to get is like, hey, everyone, we're inside this massive video game where we're getting played left and right by those the those in power that that power class you know you could change it to wake the fuck up instead of burn it the fuck down yeah um but at the same time i come back to like does it matter if you're participating in that game and doing very well why should you care well two reasons besides a a moral compass or whatnot but maybe well well and and that's gonna be the second reason right right? But, but the first reason to care is that I'm not a fight the Fed guy. On the contrary, my whole business is about, you know, what is the narrative? And even if you think the narrative's full of shit, I'm telling you, the narrative's going to win. <laughs> so, yeah. so that's, you know, the, the race doesn't always go to the swift, but, you know, that's the way you want to place your bets. And, and it's the same way for me with the narrative. I, I mean, you know, my opinion and 275 will get you a subway token. <laughs> You know, my, my whole business is trying to understand what's the narrative and, you know, pay attention to that, not what. I'm not a fight the Fed guy. But what I am is a don't give your heart to these guys. Uh, maintain a critical distance from these guys. Understand that, yes, it may be the only game in town, because that, that's the other line with the, the old poker game. You know, you yeah. okay. You know the dealer's cheating? Yeah, I know, but it's the only game, only game in town, right? <laughs> but don't kid yourself, because this is what we all start doing. We all start saying, oh, you know, it's not a game we're playing. It's not, you know, rigged in this way and that way. I'm just really smart. Right, I, right. I, I figured this out. I'm just really a genius. You know, unlike all these other rooms, I got it all figured out. But what I'm saying is play the game. Manage other people's money or your own money, whatever it is you do. Most of it's other people's money. 
and do it with that moral compass and, and, and do it with that critical distance. I think that's great. It's, it's important both to be a real human being, right? Yeah. Uh, but, it, but it's also important actually for the instrumentalism of managing other people's money. Because narratives change, the rules change. You saw this in OA, you see the different ways of it. And you don't want to be the bag holder because you will be the bag holder if you let these guys into your heart. If you start you know, believing the lines they're telling you, if you don't maintain that sort of critical distance. So my, my, my strong belief is both to maintain a compass and a, 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 as a moral human being and look for ways to change the system, which I do, as well as to navigate the system as best we can for ourselves and our family and our clients and our, the people we have a, a relationship with, a bond with, I think it's important to have that sort of critical distance. That, that's what I think we should pay right. attention to. Stuff. That's how, I, why it matters. As I view it, like if we're in the video game, the video game could break, it could glitch. You need to know you're in it in case it glitches and, and know how to react, right? Um, yeah. Know thyself. That's right. What else is going on outside inflation, outside Delta variant? What else is the narrative uh, tools you have popping up? That's my quick thoughts were the, uh, well, I'll let you answer. And if, if it's not one of those, I'll bring it up. Yeah, look, it's, it's, it's still very much our focus is on this gigantic gulf between real world and market. The bridge is going to be, does the narrative around central banks change? Not around Delta, right? Because, you know, <laughs> they will stop at nothing, right? Again, and that they've got plenty of tools for a deflationary threat. The issue is, what happens if we get disappointing growth and continued well-embedded inflation in wages, prices, autos, houses, and stocks, right? If, if we get kind of that whiff of stagflation, first time you start, you see an article about that in the journal, hey, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of uh, airspace, right, between where the market is today and where it could go. That, that's what we're looking for. Uh, and not that this is necessarily what you do, but a little bit, but what asset classes are you looking at once you get that whiff? And basically, what do you think will do well in an inflationary regime? Pricing power, pricing power, pricing power. Okay. You know, nobody talks about pricing power anymore. Uh, but if, if we get these kind of inflationary regimes, then uh, everybody's going to be talking about pricing power. And it is wonderful, right? Because I actually think maybe, maybe fundamental analysis would matter again. <laughs> you know, it's kind of a dream of mine. One day, you know, before I die or retire, I'd like to see fundamental analysis matter again, I'd like to see differences between companies matter. But uh, until then, you know, I'm just going to go out and buy my Robin Hood call spreads. <laughs> And what about like commodity owning outright commodities or trend following commodities, right? Because they should do well in a inflationary period. So, so one of the things that we're really excited about with our new narrative research is really as an indicator, not for price levels on risk assets, but for the efficacy of trend following strategies, right? Because it's um, these narratives, Narratives have a cycle to them, mm -hmm. right? They have a life cycle to them. And that's then reflected in when trend following strategies do well and when they don't. Right now, our belief is that trend following strategies, we're, we're underweight trend follow as a strategy. I'm excited though by the opportunity to be overweight trend following strategies. I think that time is coming. 
I also think that our narrative signals will tell us when that time comes. It ain't here yet. Yeah. But uh, that's what we're looking for also. And to summarize that ever would be the narrative machine right now is saying, hey, any trends are going to get handicapped or cut in half or whipsawed by the narrative that's on right now. So be careful. Once that flips, then those trends might be able to extend and and correct. We're an inflection point right now, right? So we're, you know, trend following works best in the straightaways, right? It doesn't yeah. you, know, you wanna you you wanna avoid when the when the trend flips. We are at a potential trend flipping period right now. So, you know, I don't want to be in trend following strategies right now. I'm looking forward to getting into them when we enter into a straightaway. Love it. And then uh, my last thing, I think you called the uh, inadvertently called the top in Bitcoin by uh, giving yourself the laser eyes on Twitter, adding <laughs> the uh, pay for your uh, newsletter in Bitcoin. Right. That had to be right around the same time. Or? Yeah. And, you, you know, and I, and I did all that as a uh, as cultural appropriation right because i'm 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 the 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 opposite of a bitcoin bro right i yeah. i have zero interest in bitcoin as a trading instrument or what the price of bitcoin is and that's that's you know what i write about and when i talk about that uh, so so yeah but you know that's going to be the next product we're rolling out because bitcoin was i call it bitcoin no, yeah. with jazz trademark. hands, yeah. trademark. It's a, um, it's all narrative. Right? There, there, there are no fundamentals. It's all narrative. So we, th we think we've got right. some really kind of the good ultimate signals. test for your your philosophy, right? Your theory. Right on, brother. Right on. Um, so you, what? So your thoughts are like, I don't care about it one way or the other. I'm just interested in in how this has become a thing. Exactly. And it, has, it has become a thing. So it has it, definitely become a thing. And summarize here that piece. You basically think Wall Street's co-opting it. It's going to brand it. It's going to make it even more of a thing. Already happened. You yeah. Know, the, the the ship has sailed, and it's a uh, it's Wall Street turns it into Bitcoin. You know, a, a <laughs> securitized product. Uh, the U.S. Treasury, I like to call it the Eye of Sauron, uh, puts. You know, they they just want to see all the money in the world. So, you know. All the reasons that the OG Bitcoin people were into Bitcoin, that's all gone, man. It's a, you know, it's there, there's no more, oh, we're gonna change the world. You're just you're just another table at the casino now. <laughs> right. You want to go into the Bitcoin room? Go ahead. You make a lot of money, right? But it's just another room at the it's just another you know set of tables. It's the it's the crypto room at the uh, at the at the casino. I love it. Um, all right. Any other thoughts before I let you go? No, man. Just stay healthy. Take care of yourself and your family. I will. You too. Good luck on the farm. I got to come when this is all over. I want to come visit the farm. How far from New York are you? Like uh, we're, we're an hour, hour on the train. So uh, hot scoop oh, and a junk. Perfect. Piece of cake. I should have. We were in uh, upstate at Cooperstown with my son for the Little League. Uh, oh, right on. Yeah. Well, that's in uh, July. So I could have shot over. It's not far from Woodstock, I think. Um, so yeah, looking forward to it. You stay safe. Best of luck. We'll put, uh, all the stuff. I finally, I felt guilty asking you to come on here and talk to you without, uh, signing up. So we actually signed up this morning as a uh, member. So I'm part of the pack now. Right I, on. I like an honorary member of the pack before, but I wanted to you, make it. You official. were indeed. Now you're an official member. Love uh, it. Thank you, Jeff. All right, Ben. Thank you. Thanks guys. Bye-bye. The Derivative is brought to you by CME Group. CME Group is the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. For more information and educational resources about futures and options, visit cmegroup.com. You've been listening to The Derivative. Links from this episode will be in the episode description of this channel. Follow us on Twitter at rcmalt and visit our website to read our blog or subscribe to our newsletter at rcmalt.com. If you liked our show, introduce a friend and show them how to subscribe. And be sure to leave comments. We'd love to hear from you.